again, thank you all for coming, and thanks to Cliff for the shout out during the uh, opening plenary. So I'm going to talk about the open annotation collaboration project that we're involved with at Los Alamos National Labs. Um, first, I want to talk a little bit about the collaboration and the project as a whole, but rather than bore you with tedious organizational details, I'm going to go through the hopefully less tedious uh, data model and protocolless approach that we've come up with. Finally, we'll go through a demo and then a brief summary. So the collaboration is of five funded partners, Los Alamos National Labs with Herbert and myself, uh, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign where Tim Cole is the PI, the University of Queensland in Australia where Jane Hunter is the PI, University of Maryland, Neil Freistat is the PI and George Mason University. Like I said, short. Um, the project then, um, we have three main aims, which are understandably high level, to facilitate a web-centric and interoperable annotation environment. So the key emphasis here is the web-centricness of the interoperability. Uh, to demonstrate that proposed environment for scholarly use cases, and then to seed adoption by deployment of high visibility production systems. So we have JSTOR on board for that uh, last bullet point. Currently we're in phase one, uh, at the beginning of phase one even. Um, so we're going through the exploration of existing systems, uh, exploration of requirements and use cases. We have an initial interoperability specification, which I'm gonna go through and we have made progress on integrating um, X and uh, Zotero, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, many thanks to the Mellon Foundation for funding this. Um, we have 14 months for the current phase and we hope to proceed after that onto phases two and three. Current stressed climate, to use Cliff's term, um, pending. We have a very Strong advisory board, it's practically a who's who of scholarly annotation, from uh, Maristella Agosti at the University of Padua down to John Wilbanks of Science Commons. I'm sure you can see people there that you recognize. We also have a technical group. So unlike previous um, open annotation initiatives type of uh, project, we have an open, completely open technical list. Um, please, please join um, or have your, your tech your techie join. It's the, the Google Groups URI there. Current members, not exactly the same as the, um, the project members. So we have Bruce Darkus from the uh, University of Ohio, um, Ed Summers from Library of Congress, uh, Michael Nelson sitting in the front row, and Bernard Hasselhofer from uh, University of Vienna. So interoperability then, um, We've gathered use cases and requirements primarily from humanities scholars, but also from scholarly literature um, and just looking at existing annotation systems. We're in sort of an initial design phase. This is the first part of phase one, thread one, which we're responsible for. It was discussed at a face-to-face -face meeting at UC Berkeley about a month and a half ago. We ha we've had some initial feedback on the model, um, so in particular, you know, the three points as to the difficulty of defining what an annotation actually is, um, that the model that we've come up with is very generic and we risk absolutely every piece of um, scholarly work being an annotation. So we need to sort of narrow in um, from our very broad reaching use cases and try and figure out exactly where we need to be. Um, we, and by we, I don't mean the project as a whole, just um, myself and Herbert tend to agree, but we would very much appreciate your feedback. We have a, a set of 10 sort of core principles. Um, the three basic ones which aren't to do with the data model uh, are as follows. Obviously we focus on interoperability. I think that's what we are well known for, um, to allow annotation sharing. Um, there are very, very many in non-interoperable annotation systems already. You just have to think of the web sticky notes, um, websites out there to 
um, note that. There are also existing interoperability mechanisms such as Anatea, which is a W3 standard. However, they are in dire need of updating. Uh, following on from OAI ORE, uh, we have an interoperability approach which is based very firmly in the architecture of the web. So we recognize that communication is increasingly online, the resources that scholars are talking about are increasingly online. We also want to maximize our chance of adoption by not being domain-centric, by not saying we're going to use this particular protocol with this particular set of data. We feel that the semantic web principles and linked data, which <coughs> Cliff in his accustomed clarity called dispersed data during his plenary, um, we feel that those guidelines are extremely important. And finally, from the uh, linked data guidelines, we recognize that entities within the model must be identified by HTTP URIs, and that's not a capital must, it's the first bullet point, when possible. And we also see that there are cases when you couldn't assign an HTTP URI, as desirable as that may be. The advantages of doing so, however, are pretty drastic. It's, you get globally unique identifiers for every entity within the model without any sort of central system overhead and their locators as well as identifiers. You can go to the URI and get back some sort of representation. So those are the, the basic principles. Right, onto the, the data model then. So this is not set in stone, the first bullet point I really want to, to stress. So please provide feedback if you've got concerns, queries, questions, we would love to hear them. It's also not published as a specification we don't think it's ready for that yet, um, just as guidelines and current thinking. In fact, this presentation is probably the most complete um, specification of the system as it stands. We've implemented it, but it's a, definitely a demonstrator. It's not by any means a production system yet. We're informed by previous work and expert con contributions, but we strongly believe that we extend beyond them. Um, for good reason. So we're guided by these requirements and use cases that we've analyzed, um, which we feel will ensure adoption um, by not falling into the trap that former digital library protocols beginning with Z that I won't name fell into um, by adding and adding and adding and adding features until they became completely incomprehensible. It also keeps us um, in touch with real users and their needs. There's no point adding stuff when no one wants it. So as I go through the data model, I'm gonna build it up in steps, each of which will be justified with a, an appropriate use case. So step one is a very basic requirement. Users must be able to create an annotation with some content about a target. And if you can't do that, then you're not playing the annotation game. And we have a very, very straightforward model, a baseline model, in order to do that. So we have a source of content, which is the blue node, which is somehow about the target, which is the red node. We then add an annotation node, the yellow one, which represents kind of the event. So it has a, a time and a, and a creator. So I'm gonna come back to this is about property. you could imagine any triple or any, um, any set of information being captured in those nodes otherwise. So as we have a baseline model where any resource on the web can participate in the model, that means that anything can be the content as well as the target. So this is kind of the first distinction that we have made, the first difference that we've come to from previous models. So here's an example where a YouTube video, the Hubble Deep Field, the most important image ever taken, is somehow about the Hubble Ultra Deep Field image, as exemplified by that file from Wikimedia Commons. Yeah, and the, oh, note the URIs there for those. So this means that any content you know, can be used 
doesn't have to have a particular format, doesn't have, have to have a particular language. It could be no language if it's an image. It could be anywhere on the web. Of course, we need to have some additional information about the annotation, such as who created it, when it was created, but also we try to instantiate that is about-ness, um, which we call a predicate following RDF. So, for example, you could say that um, I'm the creator of the annotation event because I'm saying that this video annotates this image. I created it on the 3rd of December, and the relationship between the content and the target is a predicate called OAC annotates. So the Hubble Deep Field YouTube video annotates the Hubble Deep Field image. All right, so that's the baseline model. That's from the basics we, from where we built. So I know a lot of you are thinking, hang on, using a video as the content of the annotation, not many systems will allow that. This is starting from a weird place. So one thing that we, you know, we, we bear that totally in mind. Um, however, assigning URIs to strings of content is increasingly easy on the web today. So for example, Twitter will assign you a URI for 140 characters. Google Docs could assign you a URI for a, a much longer document. So we don't think that that's a drastic problem with the, with the baseline. We do recognize it, however. To the point where step two is allowing for the case where you can't assign an HTTP URI to your content. So our requirement then is that the model must support systems which only support a user-entered string as the content of the annotation. So here's a, a screenshot of a quite sophisticated annotation system called Fab4, which has signed annotations, distributed search, multiple formats and robust annotations across multiple formats and so on. However, it only allows for strings entered by the user into that interface for content. So here's the case where we introduce a non-resolvable URI, so not an HTTP URI, which is called a URN. We're going to come back to this later in the protocol list, the, the, the lack of protocol uh, part, um, as to how this can be resolved. But as to the model, we have this node which state, takes the space of the content resource, and we attach a property to it called OAC, OAC body. So this is where that string would end up in the model. We also have a class called a note, which is just a hint to any client receiving the annotation to say, don't bother trying to resolve that URN. You're not going to get anything from it. Don't try and embed it. Just look in OAC body. That's your, that's your content. So for example, we could turn that previous tweet into an annotation in this mode. So we'd assign it a UUID URN. We'd attach um, to that the string by OAC body, and the target remains the same the Hubble Deep Field image. So as we've worked through um, looking at use cases and, and requirements, existing systems, we came to the conclusion that most, if, uh, if not all, but definitely most, um, annotations are actually about a part of a resource, not the entire resource. If you've got an image, it's not that common you want to talk about the entire image. Normally you'll want to say this part of the image is interesting, or you don't want to have this part, of this paragraph in the document. So a couple of examples of systems that do that. I'm sure you're all familiar with Flickr, the photo sharing site. You can have um, annotations about sequence of the, the images. So some guy's saying it would be cool if this street light was the moon, but it's not. Uh, in the more sort of scholarly realm, the Pliny annotation system uh, from King's College London also allows it on the left. 
So we have a very easy out for this, which is a W3 standard which is coming out called the Media Fragment URIs. This allows us to put a little bit on the end of any URI and all of a sudden it talks about, in a standardized way, a segment of that resource, not the whole resource. So you don't need to go mincing new URIs which are divorced from the main resource. You can just create your own little segments. For example, you'd put the hash and then x, y, w, h, and then comma separated <laughs> values for the x, y dimensions, width, and height. So using this, we can then put that URI where we'd have um, just normally the URI for the Hubble image. So here's another tweet. You know, this cluster of galaxies looks very tightly packed. I guess we need a 3D model to be sure. And the target is instead this box here, if you can see the mouse, which would be perhaps 400, 80, 100, 100. So that fits quite nicely into our model. We don't have a problem with that. However, step four, there are also cases when you wouldn't want to be able to, where you would want to be able to put, um, create segments which aren't able to be captured within the URI. So for example, I'm not sure if you can see it, um, there's a green box or green line which follows around that particular house, which maybe if you drew a a square around it, you'd get some other houses that you didn't want to talk about. You wouldn't want to try and describe that very complex line, which is sort of hand-drawn in a URI. You'd end up with an extremely long string there. So yeah, the requirement, it's important to be able to express non-rectangular regions of a resource for situations where a rectangle cannot unambiguously delineate the region of interest. Now this interface, by the way, is LIMO, which is done by Bernard Hasselhofer, um, a very inspiring model for us. So this is where we start to get slightly more complex with the data model, but hopefully uh, the majority of cases will be able to be handled by the um, W3C URI uh, fragments um, specification. So now we add a, a context node. People familiar with ORE may th think about uh, uh, proxy nodes. They're pretty similar. And from that context node, we then have a segment description. This would be a resource that describes the area or the region, the segment of the target that's of interest. So that might be an SVG path for an image, uh, X path into an XML document, um, some way of identifying a speaker within an audio track. There is work for this, such as um, in MPEG-7, so we're not trying to, or we certainly do not want to, have to go through all of the different formats and try and work out how to specify segments. Um, one area that we do think is of interest, uh, especially to this community, um, is databases and data sets how to, how to specify slices of those things. Um, this will obviously require a lot more research. So to kind of try and put that into um, an example, another tweet, these galaxies, but not the red one, look very impressive too. We then have a, a context node here, which has a segment description, an SVG, and that SVG describes this non-rectangular region here. It would then be up to the client to interpret that, um, which is obviously media type dependent and so forth. All right, step five. So for this one, we're starting to go further beyond existing models. Um, the requirement then is that you be able to annotate multiple regions or multiple resources within one annotation. So I couldn't find a good screenshot of this happening um, with a live client. So I kind of faked it in Acrobat by drawing a whole bunch of lines. 
So this is an annotation, annotating the word annotation within the handout. The requirement then, the annotation should be able to have more than one target resource or segment when the annotation concerns multiple resources or creates a relationship between resources. We modeled this in a particularly straightforward way simply by adding in additional target nodes. So we've had T1 up until now, we now have a second target, T2. The thing to note, of course, is that the relationship that we talked about at the beginning applies uniformly between the source and each target. So this source has relationship P1 to target T1, and the content has the same relationship P1 to target T2. To instantiate that, these two parts of the image have the most interesting clusters of, galaxy, of galaxies. That's the content. It annotates this part of the image and it annotates in exactly the same way this part of the image. So I hopefully haven't lost you. This is where it starts getting slightly more exotic. And one of the things that we're not sure if this should be modeled in a different way. So the number of content sources you could also multiply. So some use cases for that would be the same comment expressed in different formats. So you might have a, um, something in text and then something in MathML or XML. The same comment is expressed in different media. So I write in my string and then I record it on my microphone, upload it somewhere, and all of a sudden I have an MP3 of exactly the same sentiment. So that could be a second, a second content. Equally, I might write my comment in English. Someone thinks, oh, this is really fantastic. I'm going to translate it into French or Spanish or whatever. It's the same. It's still an annotation in that it's my content translated. Um, so that could be a, a second um, form of, of the content. And again, they would have a uniform relationship from the content source over to the target. So the Hubble deep field image is very impressive. I could record that as an MP3. Then I'd have two contents, both, both about the same image. An alternative way of doing this would be to simply have one as the content and the other one related to it by, for example, DC terms has format, rather than having them both as content. But then the flip side of that is you're preferring one if you've got a client that say has a, um, is for um, visually challenged people, they might really prefer that MP3. Or if you've got one in French and one in English, you know, I might prefer it in English, but someone else would certainly prefer it in French. So step six then, how am I doing? The requirement is that the annotation be robust across time. So one of the problems with the web, or problems in inverted commas, uh, is that at any given URI, you can have totally different representations being returned. You know, if I go to CNN one day, it's different to the next day, it's different to the next 10 minutes probably. So when I was talking about CNN.com, what was I really talking about? Was it about TNN.com at that particular time or was it about the sort of semantics of the page in general? So here we have one content in blue, but then across time at CNN.com, for example, we have a whole bunch of different things that I could be talking about. This is one of the main areas that we think we're going to be adding into the sort of um, knowledge about annotations. Um, a lot of other systems have kind of used the URI web-based model, but totally ignored this problem. Of course, this is a very good time to plug our talk tomorrow morning, if you're, if you're up. So please come here to talk about, uh, to hear us talk about Memento uh, tomorrow morning. To put this into context, 
I could have tweeted um, a very sad story today, Tuesday 1st of December, on the BBC News about South African babies with HIV. You know, then here's the BBC News page. It's got absolutely nothing about that. Still got nothing about it. Oh, there it is. Next day, it's gone. It's gone. So I need to be able to get back to that third page. How are we going to do that? So solution number one, we say that the created timestamp for the annotation event should be used as the date time of the version of both content and target resources unless it's specified otherwise. So for example, the annotation event was created on the 1st of December, Twitter tweet was on the 1st of December, page on the 1st of December, it's all good. But then I can't say, did you see BBC yesterday? Didn't you think that story was great? It's like, well, hang on, now yesterday isn't when I created the event. So that doesn't work. So we go back to the, the context node and we add another property called OAC when. So this timestamp T2, different from the timestamp of the created date for the annotation, is when the target should be interpreted, you know, the version of the target. So if you have, for example, a comment on multiple, play, multiple resources, you'd have different context nodes, each potentially with different OAC when properties. And then you're unambiguously stating, this is when I mean it to apply. Uh, the third solution is simply to avoid the problem completely and annotate a stored copy of that page. So um, we've got the Internet Archive or um, Archive It web citation, simply push it into an archive, annotate the archived version, but then say, this was here at this time. Step seven, the obvious last step, is that once we've got all of this model, we then need to be able to interact with it. We need a, we need a description, which we call a transcription, um, of the annotation event. Um, Google has a side wiki with a whole bunch of XML, and Atea also has a description property. We use the same conventions as linked data, and hence ORE. Um, and introduce this sort of transcription node, which is a resource that you can get to anywhere on the, anywhere on the web. So this is the sort of dispersed data um, methodology that Cliff talked about in his summary. And that's the, that's the full data model. We think it goes far enough to capture everything, not too far to capture things which are totally irrelevant, um, but we definitely want your feedback on it. We did a bunch of background research, um, starting with Anatea, obviously, as a W3 standard, and also looking at the comments about Anatea to see what people liked, what people didn't like. Limo is a much more recent uh, annotation system. It's now in use by the European Library um, and uses similar sorts of concepts in terms of linked data. Uh, Dilas is a European um, annotation system for plenty Google, obviously. You know, there's an 800 pound gorilla standing around with an annotation system, we can't avoid it. Flickr annotations, maybe a 650 pound gorilla. Um, but also tags. So many, many, many systems have tags. You could think of a tag as a very simple annotation on a resource, so we've looked at them. We believe that our model covers all of this as well as other requirements that we had from the, from the scholarly community. So the one area where we've totally left current practice is that um, existing systems are very tightly coupled. You know, the client knows how to talk to the server, the one server, and the server knows how to send back that information. So Anatea has a protocol, it's very REST based, which is good. Um, Google SideWiki uses Atom for 
getting the annotations from the server to the client. Currently, you can't create an annotation outside of their interface, but there's a lot of requests for that, obviously. So those are the exceptions. Most of them are completely proprietary. How Digo or WebNotes stores their or creates their um, little post-it notes for web pages, no one knows. So we think this is a hindrance to interoperability to the point where any protocol that ties servers and clients together is a hindrance. So we are going to recommend no protocol as opposed to recommending a protocol. I know what you're thinking. So here's the, the Google model, right? You've got your Google interface. It talks the Google protocol to the Google side wiki servers. It stores them. Other Google clients come in talking the Google protocol to the Google side wiki. And you could be doing it on your Google Droid phone, which runs the Google Chromium OS, and Google Chrome for the browser, which runs over Google HTTPS and uses the new Google DNS, et cetera, et cetera. Right? This is the, the lock-in proprietary model, as much as Google claims it's open. The scary thing is I didn't actually need to invent any of these things. These are all totally real. So here's our sort of web-based protocolless approach. So the client has to obviously send the annotation somewhere to store. It could, or it could send it to multiple places. The server then retrieves the annotation using regular discovery techniques. You, know, you could have an RSS feed of your annotations. You could put them in an OAIPMH server. However, people normally discover things on the web. You could use Google to find them. Or it could be on demand from the client. So you put it on a web server somewhere, then you poke the server and say, hey, go get it. Or it could be that the server is just one place of many that you happen to send your annotation. And then on the server side, that one server that you sent it to could be just one place of many that you can get your annotation from. And once it's a resource on the web, anyone can go fetch it, pull it back, put it into their server, which indexes, say, the annotations, makes them available. And the blue line in the diagram, servers can talk to each other. If one server makes an OAIPMH or an Atom interface available for all of the servers, all of the annotations that's, that it has collected, other systems could go in and suck down all of their annotations to create sort of a, a meta annotation server. So this is a much more colorful diagram. There is an orange absolutely everywhere. So my preferred client interface, I create it by posting it on my blog, say. Or I push it to Twitter, or I just stick it on a web server somewhere that I control. Different harvesters can then come in, suck them down, index them, and other clients that other people prefer can then talk to their preferred server. There's some obvious consequences of this. So multiple servers or aggregators or applications can all access your annotation. It's just a resource on the web, like any other resource. The client then uses whatever protocol is required by the storage server. So that could be just an HTTP push. You could use um, SCP to push it to your a personal web server, you could use Twitter to tweet it, you could put it on a blog, you could do whatever. Annotations, as I just stressed, are regular web resources by necessity. So this isn't by design or at the convenience of the server, it's by necessity. And another thing that you were probably thinking immediately previous, what about access control? How do I have groups of servers that I can that can access my annotation? Ooh. As interoperability people, our immediate reaction is, no, you shouldn't do that. Just have it open and let anyone do it. But that's not a realistic view. So using this model, we don't have to come up with our own authentication and authorization system. We don't have to, have, we don't have to model groups and users. All we have to do is say, well, it's up to you to configure whatever server you store your annotations on to only allow access to servers that can, 
that you trust to distribute your annotation. So then it's just like any other web authentication authorization system. You could use OpenID, um, Shibboleth, basic authentication, whatever you want. Another um, positive consequence, we think, um, is that services can be used to extend this information in the annotation. So just because you've published it, someone else can come in and talk about your annotation um, because it's linked open data. So for example, a service might add extra information to increase the robustness over time or across formats. You know, it goes in, inspects your annotation, inspects the target resource, and then publishes something in RDF which says, and it's about this particular part of the, of the target resource. You could add extra information for the robustness of the segment location, um, text mining, data mining across annotations, graph mining or relationship mining across lots of annotations. You know, the possibilities are endless. I said that I'd come back to this URN for strings, so this is where I'm coming back to it. Servers um, can replace those URNs with URIs. So for example, say, um, an annotation aggregator finds your annotation which has a URN for the content. It pulls it down, puts it in its database. It can then replace the URN with an HTTP URI that it controls. So you don't have to mint it, the server mints it. And say that it's the same as your URN. So it uses your identifier for deduplication because remember multiple servers can all aggregate your annotation but it mints URIs that are accessible from the web. So here I am in Flickr with an image which is kind of big. I have a bookmarklet which says annotate that pulls me into my annotation interface which is built on J2K. With J2K you can zoom in, you can move around, you can investigate the whole image quite nicely. We click on this little button which says show and here are the annotations that it's found. This first one then is a rectangular region, so the basic thing. It's got a string as the content. Up here we have another non-rectangular region which we want to identify. If we zoom out, we then can see the top annotation, which is about two people, Roy Fielding and Sir Tim Berners-Lee. So there's an example of multiple at targets. So you want to create one. We'll add a title, the sun, so say you want to talk about the sun. The sun is a happy looking dude. It's a sort of kind of circular thing, so we'll create a circular region. Just by dragging it, you can then drag that around. You can resize it to get the right location. I'm going to post it to my blog, Rob's Annotations. Click Create. It says annotation created, and it's requested the reharvest. So it's the, the pull on demand. Go into Blogger. So this is this is Blogger's interface, not mine. And there's the new annotation that we created. It's about the Flickr object, and there's the string. We go back. And we'll, if we go back to Show, Show, all of a sudden here's our new annotation. This one. Click on it, and there's the region that it's about. Here's a slightly more complicated or functional interface. It's about a medieval manuscript. You can see all of the transcription of it. There's a whole bunch of additional options that you might want to play with. We're concerned with annotations, of course. So let's have a look at them. So here's a YouTube example. I'm Christopher de Hamel. Uh, he's um, saying, I am my name's Christopher de Hamel, and I'm blah, 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 blah. Cambridge University. Uh, or you could use SlideShare as a place where you've stored your content. There's the slides that can embed them. It's not really about the image, but it's at least somewhat related. So that was a, an annotation on the annotation for replies. You can of course have squares or multiple different regions. Here's using Twitter to get the string. 
So that's the actual URL, that's the resource, and then the interface pulls it in. Or you could use an image as the thing, as the uh, content, and the reply is how very MySpace. So that's great for images. What about web pages in general? So using the same interface, we click on annotate, it does a screen capture of it to pull it in because we built it on J2K, which is a image server. Zoom in to get to the point that we're interested in, which is say this top server about Sudan. Create a new interface, clicking on create, give it a title, Sudan. Give it some content, the plight of Sudan is pretty terrible. It will draw the region that we're interested in, or that it concerns. Click on create, and again we'll get the annotation created, rehab was requested. So we've got a blogger, just to show you that it's posting it there. Here's the thing, it's in reply to cnn.com, oh dear. You can see what's coming up, I'm sure. Flight of Sudan is pretty terrible. We come back. And let's show the annotations that are about CNN.com. Oh, family abductions made yesterday. Hang on, what's this? Okay, so there's the current one. So yesterday, the article that was in that space was about family abductions. So that, that's the need for the time robustness. Okay, so in summary, uh, the collaboration is up and working. Um, we've had a whole bunch of conference calls. Um, we've done some good collaborative work. Uh, the data model, we have the alpha version ready for feedback, which we uh, strongly solicit. Um, but it's not a specification document yet. You've seen as much as anyone knows right now. Um, it covers the use cases and requirements that we've gathered and analyzed. It covers as much previous work as we could possibly go through in the last four months. It's based on linked data and the web architecture um, for the data model. And instead of having a protocol like we've had in the past, um, we have this sort of protocolless interaction between distributed servers and clients. Those are the, the URIs. Um, open Annotation is the main project site. There's the OAC Tech Group. For, if you've got any comments at all, please join and, and we can discuss them. Or if you'd rather not post them in the open, those are our emails that we have on our iPhones as opposed to our LANOR ones. Our presentation, as we said at the beginning, is being videoed. It will be posted. Um, if you want to look at the slides, there they are, or the YouTube video um, for the demo is there. And I thank you all very much for your attention. Could you please, um, if you have questions, use the microphone so that it can be heard. TLS, question is this, uh, when you download an external URN and convert it to a local URI, mm -hmm. is there any need to maintain a link from the URI that you created back to the URN? Absolutely. And what would the reasons be? So, <laughs> so the, uh, the reason, or the, the main reason um, is that because you've posted it online, it doesn't mean that there's just going to be one server that downloads it into their system and creates a URI for it. So you put your annotation up and you give it a UUID. Uh, server one finds it and says, oh, I'm gonna do the right thing. I'm gonna create a URI for this URN and say it's example1.com slash UUID. Another server comes along, finds it, and says, I'm going to pull down this annotation, look at it, oh, a UUID. I'm going to do the right thing and turn that into a URI. Server2.org slash UUID. Now you've got three identifiers which aren't linked at all for the same resource. So if, they're all, if they all maintain the UUID, you can then use that as the sort of deduplication key so that you could have server four which comes in and says, okay, I'm going to harvest all of these servers up together. I've got these very similar ones, but they've got different URIs. 
So without the UUID being maintained as the point of deduplication, that might create you know, 20 different copies of the same annotation. Got it. Thank you, Jack. I'm oh, sorry that wasn't clear in the presentation. Are there any other questions? Ed. Um, Uma Murthy, a PhD student, been working with me on the same problem for about three or four years, uh, has some, a lot of good results. I think you might be interested. I sent you an email about this, and so maybe she can join the tech group if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, in particular, sh we've been collaborating with um, David Mayer and Lois Delkem at Portland State University, who've been working on marks and superimposed information. Probably seen this at some of our digital library meetings. Um, it seems very important to separate out marking parts of objects from the other parts of this activity, which I see you have a, a standard you referred to. Maybe yep. you can comment a little bit more about that. I didn't get that. Um, by, by the marks, do you mean, for example, the... And, and, and identifying segments, because oh, yep. most people refer to pieces of things, not just the whole thing. Yep. Right? And that's, yep. that's a major problem in the internet right now. We can't refer to parts of things very well. Yep. Yeah. So we hope to use the URI segments specification coming out of the W3C for that, and for parts where it's not possible. Hopefully some interested community will come up with a, a reasonably well-adopted standard for describing the segment as for that media type. So for example, MBEG 7 has a whole bunch of different uh, ways of specifying sections of video and audio in particular. Um, there's a very simple way of doing it with the URI segments, but that's seriously not going to be sufficient for humanities scholars' uses. So we're kind of pushing the problem down the road, but we think we can cover the majority of use cases either with things like SVG, XPath, you know, well-adopted web standards, um, <coughs> and the URI fragments from W3C. Yeah, no, we'd be very, very interested in hearing about um, additional work in the area because we acknowledge, recognize that that is a issue um, that will not go away. It absolutely must be addressed. Just to add to this, um, we've actually been in touch with the people of the W3C uh, Media Fragment Identifier Group, um, actually trying to convince them to um, embrace our segment approach. So their current approach is that they uh, will allow for uh, fragment identifiers for rather basic simple use cases such as the rectangular regions uh, that Rob showed or for uh, a sequence of a video or an audio recording, what have you not, a chapter in a book, a track on a CD, so really basic things. Basically those are all uh, by value descriptions, you know, in the URI fragment. We've been in touch uh, proposing them to also allow a uh, by reference description. So like the uh, fragment describing documents that we propose here, the idea would be that you would have uh, the URI of the original resource and then just like in the fragment, the current fragments, you know, you have a hash, but then you would have a URI of a document that describes a segment of that. And the feedback wasn't positive in the sense that they, well, you know, uh, the easy response is it's beyond the scope of what we want to do. And then the discussion is, of course, uh, closed. So that's kind of where we're at with that. Um, it would have been, of course, nice to embed it in a W3C standard, but I, I, it didn't feel to us that the door was really open there. Thanks for that, Rob Herbert. That's really good. Um, one question I had was that you usually think of a context as a sort of enclosing or encapsulating bigger thing, and you have your context target as a, the segment of the target. Is that a sort of so dumbed down works nicely, or can you talk about that a bit? Yep. So, in the, the same way, let me go back to it. In the same way as we had proxies in ORE, <clears throat> we wanted to have some sort of node um, from which to hang the segment description and OAC when for the time dimension, which is in some ways you know, the same sort of thing as a segment description, a segment in time across multiple representations or a segment of the representation. 
So, yes, uh, the context node is really so that you don't have to mint a new URI in, for each segment, which is going to make for many, many, many URIs not, which won't have standard ways of constructing them like the URI um, specification from W3C has. So say you wanted to talk about a particular path in the resource, we don't want to have to put some totally arbitrary set of data into a URI. So th then we needed a new node in the graph because we use RDF. Um, we thought it would be better to have a, a sort of context node or a, you know, a it's up for names are, are the least part of our data modeling problem. So if there's a better name than context, we are very happy to change it. Especially as content context is rather a mouthful. Um, so anyway, we have this context node which we then, ha then hang the descriptions off. Um, one of the project partners, um, uh, Jane Hunter from Queensland, used a very similar approach to this in previous work. So we decided that of the four, I think, versions of the model that we went through, particularly in, in this area, we thought this was the, the least number of new URIs being minted, along with the, the best sort of backwards compatibility. And um, if you don't understand the segment description, you're at least now annotating still the resource. right? So a really stupid client that only understands content and target, you'll at least get to the right resource as opposed to trying to resolve some UUID and going, that doesn't exist, I'm not going to do anything. Does that cover the... Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, we have a couple minutes left. Are there any other questions? Uh, a great presentation, thank you very much. Uh, Tom Kramer from Stanford. Uh, in your demonstration, I don't know if that was proof of concept or the plan for a further system, I think you demonstrated the regions of interest quite well, but uh, during the uh, manuscript page, I, you clicked on and off and you had annotations actually overlaid on top of text. Is that a core part of the system and could you talk more about how you plan to annotate textual regions or textual sections of documents? The, the short answer is no. <laughs> uh, we can't really talk about it in much detail because we haven't considered annotating text within images um, and the distinction between annotating the depicted text and the pixels which make up that. You know, it's kind of a, a Ferber problem but on crack, right? Um, what level of which works representation expression, uh, uh, uh oh. Um, yes, it's a, a problem which we know will come up, especially in the humanities where people love um, having a, an image of a manuscript and talking about the text that's depicted as opposed to the, the actual image. Um, we hope we can do it with classes of annotation. So you might have a, a class of annotation which is a textual annotation as opposed to a art history or art historical annotation. Um, so you could have two or a um, paleographical annotation if you wanted to talk about the handwriting of the text which is depicted as opposed to the text which is depicted or just the depiction. Um, so yes, we, we hope that the classes of annotation will at least go some way towards that. Um, at the moment, we're still in the sort of data modeling overall scope rather than really drilling down into the complicated um, things like that. The, the little yellow boxes that came up um, weren't annotations. Um, they were sort of hard-coded things which sit in JavaScript rather than um, on annotation servers. They could be done as, as areas um, with uh, full annotation, but it seemed overkill. Thank you, that's a, that's a good question. All right, well, thank you all very much for coming.
Please, as a final note, come to our Memento talk, same place, tomorrow morning.